92nd Street Y online media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program, part of the Unterberg Poetry Center's 75 at 75 project, features William Trevor reading from his work. It was recorded on May 22, 1990, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. Good evening. I'm going to read you a story called, thank you. I'm going to read you a story called Kathleen's Field. I'm reading it because it was first published in this city, in the New Yorker, and it seems apt to read it tonight. Kathleen's Field. I'm after a field of land, sir. Haggerty's tone was modest to the bank agent, careful and cautious. I was wondering, sir, his voice trailed away when Mr. Enzo's head began to shake. He'd like to say yes, the bank agent assured him. He would say yes this very instant. Only what use would it be when head office wouldn't agree? They're bad times, Mr. Haggerty. It was a Monday morning in 1948. Leaning on the counter, his right hand still grasping the stick he'd used to drive three bullocks the seven miles from his farm, Haggerty agreed that the times were as bad as ever he'd known them. He'd brought the bullocks in to see if he could get a price for them, but he hadn't been successful. All the way on his journey, he'd been thinking about the field old Lally had spent his lifetime carting the rocks out of. The widow the old man had left behind had sold the 19 acres on the other side of the hill, but the last of her fields was awkwardly placed for anyone except Haggerty. They both knew it would be convenient for him to have it. They both knew there'd be almost as much profit in that single pasture as there was in all the land he possessed already. Gently sloping, naturally drained, it was free of weeds and thistles, and the grass it grew would do you good to look at. I'd help you if I could, Mr. Haggerty, the bank agent assured him, only there's still a fair bit owing. Ah, well, you gave it your consideration, sir. He said it because it was his way to make matters easier for someone who had lent him money in the past. Haggerty was a humble man. He had a tired look about him, his spare figure stooped from the shoulders, a black hat always on his head. He hadn't removed it in the bank, nor did he in Shaughnessy's provisions and bar, where he sat in a corner by himself with a bottle of stout to console him. He reflected as he drank that he hardly needed the bank agent's reminder about the times being bad. Seven of his ten children had emigrated four to Canada and America, the three others to England. Kathleen, the youngest, now 16, was left with Biddy, who wasn't herself, and Con, who would inherit the farm. But without the Lally's field, it wouldn't be easy for Con to keep going. Sooner or later, he would want to marry the Kilfeder girl, and it'd always have to be a home for Biddy on the farm, and for a while at least, an elderly mother and father would have to be accommodated also. Sometimes one or other of the exiled children sent back a check, and Haggerty never objected to accepting it. But none of them could afford the price of a field, and he wasn't going to ask them. Nor would Con accept these little presents when his time came to take over the farm entirely. For how could the oldest brother be beholden in the prime of his life? It wasn't the same for Haggerty himself. He'd been barefoot on the farm as a child, which was when his humility had been learned. Are you keeping yourself well, Mr. Haggerty? Mrs. Shaughnessy inquired 
crossing the small bar to where he sat. She was a big, tall woman whom he remembered as a girl before he'd married into the shop. She wore a bit of makeup, and her clothes were more colorful than his wife's, although they were hidden now by her green shop overall. In her late middle age, well-to-do was the description that everything about Mrs. Shaughnessy insisted upon. I was wanting to ask you, Mr. Haggerty, I'm on the lookout for a country girl to assist me in the house. If they're any good, they're like gold dust these days. Would you know of one out your way? Haggerty began to shake his head and was at once reminded of the bank agent shaking his. It was then, while he was still actually engaged in that motion, that he recalled a fact which previously had been of no interest to him. Mrs. Shaughnessy's husband lent people money. As well as the provisions and bar, he owned a barber shop and was an agent for the Property and Life Insurance Company. Haggerty had heard of people mortgaging an area of their land with Mr. Shaughnessy, or maybe the farmhouse itself, and as a consequence been able to buy machinery or stock. Haven't you a daughter yourself, Mr. Haggerty? Pardon me now if I'm guilty of a presumption, but I always say if you don't ask, you won't know. Haven't you a daughter not long left the nuns? Kathleen's round, open features came into his mind, momentarily softening his own. His youngest daughter was inclined to plumpness and to freckles, but her wide, uncomplicated smile often radiated moments of prettiness in her face. She'd always been his favorite, although Biddy, of course, had a special place also. No, she's not long left the convent, he said. Her face slipped away, darkening to nothing in his imagination. He thought again of the lally's field, the curving shape of it like a tea cloth thrown over a bush to dry. A stream ran among the few little ash trees at the bottom. The morning sun lingered on the heart of it. Are you thinking of Kathleen, Mrs. Shaughnessy? Well, I am. I'll be truthful with you, I am. At that moment, someone rapped with a coin on the counter of the grocery, and Mrs. Shaughnessy hurried away. If Kathleen came to work in the house above the provisions and bar, he might be able to bring up the possibility of a mortgage, and the grass was so rich in the field that it wouldn't be too many years before a mortgage would be paid off. Con would be left secure, Biddy would be provided for. Of course, she would be raw, Mrs. Shaughnessy said on her return. I'd have to train every inch of her. Well, I have experience in that, all right. You train them, Mr. Haggerty, and the next thing is they go off to get married. There's no sign of that, is there? Ah, uh, no, no. It's best to know the family. It's best to know a father like yourself. As Mrs. Shaughnessy spoke, her husband appeared behind the bar. He was a small man with gray hair brushed into spikes and a map of broken veins dictating a warm redness in his complexion. He wore a collar and tie, which Haggerty did not, and the waistcoat and trousers of a dark blue suit. He carried a number of papers in his right hand and a packet of sweet afton cigarettes in his left. He spread the papers out on the bar and having lit a cigarette, proceeded to scrutinize them. While he listened to Mrs. Shaughnessy's further exposition of her theme, Haggerty was unable to take his eyes off him. You get in a country girl and you wouldn't know was she clean, or maybe would she take things? We had a queer one once used to eat a raw onion. You'd go into the kitchen and she'd be at it. <laughs> what are you chewing, Kitty, you'd say to her. And she'd open her mouth and you'd see the onion in it. Ah, uh, Kathleen wouldn't eat onions. <laughs> I'm not saying she would. Des, will you bring Mr. Haggerty another bottle of stout? He has a girl for us. Kathleen was led from room to room 
and felt alarmed. She had never experienced a carpet beneath her feet before. There were boards on linoleum in the farmhouse and linoleum in the Reverend Mother's room at the convent. She found the papered walls startling. Flowers cascaded in the corners and ran in a narrow band around the room close to the ceiling. Mrs. Shaughnessy laughed, amused by the wonder in Kathleen's face. Her chin became long and smooth and the skin tightened on her forehead. Her very white, false teeth shifted slightly behind her reddened lips. The laugh was a sedate whisper that quickly exhausted itself. Now, this would be your own room, Kathleen, Mrs. Shaughnessy said, leading her into a small bedroom at the top of the house. There was a wash basin with a jug standing in it, and a bed with a mattress on it, and a cupboard. The stand, the basin, and the jug were on was painted white, and so was the cupboard. A net curtain covered the bottom half of a window, and at the top there was a brown blind like the ones in the Reverend Mother's room. There wasn't a carpet on the floor, and there wasn't linoleum either, but a rug stretched on the boards by the bed, and Kathleen couldn't help imagining her bare feet stepping onto its softness first thing every morning. There'll be the two uniforms the last girl had, Mrs. Shaughnessy said. They'd easy fit, although I'd say you were bigger on the chest. That was the first intimation that Mrs. Shaughnessy considered her suitable for the post. The dresses were hanging in the cupboard, she said, one for the morning, one for the afternoon. There were sheets and blankets in the hot press. I'll call you Kitty. Mrs. Shaughnessy said, if you wouldn't object. The last girl was Kitty, and so was another we had. <laughs> Kathleen said, that was all right. I was never better pleased with you, her father said when Kathleen returned home. You're a great little girl. When she'd packed some of her clothes into a suitcase, that her sister Mary Florence had left behind after a visit. He said it was hardly like going away at all because she was only going seven miles. She'd return every Sunday afternoon. It wasn't like England or Chicago. He explained that the wages he had agreed would be held back and set against the debt. It was that that made the whole thing possible, reducing his monthly repayments to a figure he was confident he could manage, even with the bank overdraft. She said she understood. There was a new sprightliness about her father. The fatigue in his face had given way to an excited pleasure. His gratitude to the Shaughnessys and her mother's gratitude had made the farmhouse a different place during the last couple of weeks. Biddy and Con had been affected by it, and so had Kathleen herself even though she had no idea what life would be like in the house above Shaughnessy's provisions and bar. Mrs. Shaughnessy hadn't outlined her duties, beyond saying that every night when she went up to bed, she should carry with her the alarm clock from the kitchen dresser and carry it down again every morning. The most important thing of all appeared to be that she should rise promptly from her bed. Kathleen's field is what we call it, her father said, and added after a moment, they're decent people, Kathleen. You're going to a decent house. Oh, I know, I know. But after only half a day there, Kathleen wished she was back in the farmhouse. She knew at once how much she was going to miss the comfort of the kitchen, she had known all her life. And the room along the passage she shared with Biddy, where Mary Florence had slept also, and the dogs nosing up to her in the yard. She knew how much she would miss Con and her father and her mother, and how she'd miss looking after Biddy. Now, I'll show you how to set a table, Mrs. Shaughnessy said. Listen to this carefully, Kitty. Cork mats 
were put down on the tablecloth so that the heat of the dishes wouldn't penetrate to the polished surface beneath. Small plates were placed on the left of each mat to put the skins of potatoes on. A knife and a fork were arranged on each side of the mats and a spoon and a fork across the top. The pepper and salt were placed so that Mr. Shaughnessy could easily reach them. Serving spoons were placed by the bigger mats in the middle. The breakfast table was set the night before with the cups upside down in the saucers so that they wouldn't catch the dust when the ashes were taken from the fireplace. Can you cut kindling, Kitty? I'll show you how to do it with the little hatchet. She showed her as well how to sleep, sweep the carpet on the stairs with a stiff hand brush and how to use the dustpan. She explained that every mantelpiece in the house had to be dusted every morning and all the places where grime would gather. She showed her where saucepans and dishes were kept and instructed her on how to light the range, the first task of the day. The backyard required brushing once a week, on Saturday between four o'clock and five. And every morning after breakfast, water had to be pumped from the tank in the yard, 15 minutes work with the hand lever. That's the WC you'd use, Kitty, Mrs. Shaughnessy indicated, leading her to a privy in another part of the backyard. The maids always use this one. The dresses, of the uniforms didn't fit. She looked at herself in the blue one and then in the black. The mirror on the dressing table was tarnished, but she could tell that neither uniform enhanced her in any way whatsoever. She looked as fat as a fool, she thought, with the hems all crooked and the sleeves too tight on her forearms. Oh, now, that's really very good, Mrs. Shaughnessy said. She demonstrated how the bodice of the apron was kept in place and how the afternoon cap should be worn. Is your father fit? Mr. Shaughnessy inquired when he came upstairs for a six o'clock tea. He is, sir. Suddenly Kathleen had to choke back tears because without any warning, the reference to her father had made her want to cry. He was shook the day I saw him, Mr. Shaughnessy said on account he couldn't sell the old bullocks. He's all right now, sir. The Shaughnessy's son reappeared then too, a narrow-faced youth who hadn't addressed her when he'd arrived in the dining room in the middle of the day and didn't address her now. There were just the three of them, two younger children having grown up and gone away. Mrs. Shaughnessy said the narrow-faced son would inherit the businesses, the barber shop and the provisions and bar maybe even the insurances. With a bout of wretchedness, Kathleen was reminded of Con inheriting the farm. Before that, he'd marry Angie Kilfeder, who wouldn't hesitate to accept him now that the farm was improved. Kathleen finished laying the table and went back to the kitchen where Mrs. Shaughnessy was frying rashers and eggs and slices of soda bread. When they were ready, she scooped them onto three plates, and Kathleen carried the tray with a teapot on it as well into the dining room. Her instructions were to return to the kitchen when she'd done so, and to fry her own rasher and eggs, and soda bread, if she wanted it. I don't know will we make much of that one, she heard Mrs. Shaughnessy saying as she closed the dining room door. That night, she lay awake in the strange bed, not wanting to sleep because sleep would too swiftly bring the morning and another day like the day there'd been. She couldn't stay here. She'd say that on Sunday. If they knew what it was like, they wouldn't want her to. She sobbed, thinking again of the sheepdogs lying by the fire and Biddy turning the wheel of the bellows, the only household task she could do. She thought of her mother and father sitting at the table, as they always did. Her mother knitting, her father pondering with his hat still on his head. If they could see her in the dresses, they'd understand. 
If they could see her standing there, pumping up the water, they'd surely be sorry for the way she felt. I haven't the time to tell you twice, Kitty, Mrs. Shaughnessy had said over and over again, her long, painted face not smiling in any way whatsoever. When Kathleen opened her eyes, roused by the alarm clock at half past six, she didn't know where she was. Then, one after another, the details of the previous day impinged on her waking consciousness. The cork mats, the shed where the kindling was cut, the narrow face of the Shaughnessy's son, the greasy doorknobs in the kitchen, the impatience in Mrs. Shaughnessy's voice. The reality was worse than the confusions of the dreams she'd had. And there was nothing magical about the softness of the rug beneath her feet. She didn't even notice it. She lifted her nightdress over her head and for a moment caught a glimpse of her nakedness in the tarnished looking glass, plumply rounded thighs and knees, the dimple in her stomach. She drew on stockings and underclothes, feeling even more lost than she had when she tried not to go to sleep. She knelt by her bed, and when she'd offered her usual prayers, she asked that she might be taken away from the Shaughnessy's house. She asked that her father would understand when she told him. The master's waiting on his breakfast, Kitty. I lit the range the minute I was down, ma'am. If you don't get it going by 20 to 7, it won't be hot in time. Did you pull the dampers out? The paper wouldn't catch, ma'am. Set the alarm for 6 if you're going to be slow with the fire. If the breakfast is not on the table by a quarter to 8, he'll raise the roof. Have you the plates in the bottom oven? When Kathleen opened the door of the bottom oven, a black kitten darted out, <laughs> scratching the back of her hand in its agitation. Great God Almighty, exclaimed Mrs. Shaughnessy. Are you trying to roast the poor cat? <laughs> I, I didn't know it was in there, ma'am. You lit the fire with the poor creature inside there. What were you thinking to do that, Kitty? I, I didn't know, ma'am. Always look in the two ovens before you light the range, child. Didn't you hear me telling you? After breakfast, when Kathleen went into the dining room to clear the table, Mrs. Shaughnessy was telling her son about the kitten in the oven. Haven't they brains like turnips, she said, even though Kathleen was in the room. The son released a half-hearted smile. But when Kathleen asked him if he'd finished with the jam, he didn't reply. Try to speak a bit more clearly, Kitty, Mrs. Shaughnessy said later on. It's not everyone can understand a country accent. The day was similar to the day before, except that at 11 o'clock, Mrs. Shaughnessy said, go upstairs, take off your cap, put on your coat and go down the street to Crawley's a half a pound of round steak and suet. Take the book off the dresser. He'll know who you are when he sees it. So far, that was the pleasantest chore she'd been asked to do. She had to wait in the shop because there were two other people before her, both of whom held the butcher in conversation. Ah, sure I know your father, Mr. Crawley said when he'd asked her name. And he held her in conversation also wanting to know if her father was in good health and asking about her brothers and sisters. He'd heard about the buying of the Lally's field. She was the last uniformed maid in the town, he said, now that Nellie Broderick at O'Mara's had had to give up because of her legs. Are you mad? Mrs. Shaughnessy shouted at her on her return. I should be down in the shop and not waiting to put that meat on. Didn't I tell you yesterday not to be loitering in the mornings? I'm sorry, ma'am. Only Mr. Crawley, bring coal up to the dining room and get out the mustard. Can you make up mustard? Kathleen had never tasted mustard in her life. She had heard of it, but did not precisely know what it was. She began to say she wasn't sure about making some. But even before she spoke, Mrs. Shaughnessy sighed 
and told her to wash down the front steps instead. I don't want to go back there, Catherine said on Sunday. I can't understand what she says to me. It's lonesome the entire time. Her mother was sympathetic, but even so, she shook her head. There's people I used to know, she said. People placed like ourselves whose farms failed on them. They're walking the roads now, no better than tinkers. I have ten children, Kathleen, and seven are gone from me. There's five of them I'll maybe never see again. It's that you have to think of, pet. I cried the first night. I was that lonesome when I got into bed. But isn't it a clean room you're in, pet? And aren't you given food to eat that's better than you'd get here? And don't the dresses she supplies save us an expense again? Wouldn't you think of all that, pet? A bargain had been struck, her mother also reminded her. And a bargain was a bargain. Biddy said it sounded great, going out into the town for messages. She'd give anything to see a house like that with the coal fires and the stairs. I'd say they were well pleased with you, Kathleen's father said when he came in from the yard later on. You would have been back here inside a day if they weren't. She'd done her best, she thought, as she rode away from the farmhouse on Mary Florence's bicycle. If she'd done everything badly, she would have obtained her release. She wept because she wouldn't see Biddy and Con and her father and mother for another week. She felt as if she could not bear it, more counting of the days until Sunday. And when Sunday came, the few hours passing so swiftly. But she knew by now that she would remain in the Shaughnessy's house for as long as was necessary. Fry the bread like I showed you, Kitty. Get it brown on both sides. The master likes it crisp. There was something Mr. Shaughnessy liked also, which Kathleen discovered when seven of her free Sunday afternoons had gone by. She was dusting the dining room mantelpiece one morning when he came in and stood very close to her. She thought she was in his way and moved out of it. But a week or so later, he stood close to her again, his breath warm on her cheek. When it happened the third time, she felt herself blushing. It was in this manner that Mr. Shaughnessy, rather than his wife, came to occupy for Kathleen the central role in the household. The narrow-faced son remained as he had since the day of her arrival, a dour presence contributing little in the way of conversation and never revealing the fruits of his brooding silence. Mrs. Shaughnessy came into the kitchen at midday to cook meat and potatoes and one of the milk puddings her husband was addicted to, but otherwise the kitchen was Kathleen's province now, and it was she who was responsible for the frying of the food for breakfast and for the six o'clock tea. Mrs. Shaughnessy preferred to be in the shop. She enjoyed the social side of that, she told Kathleen, and she enjoyed the occasional half glass of cherry in the bar. Kitty settled in grand, she informed Kathleen's father when he looked in one fair day to make a mortgage payment. Mr. Shaughnessy never said anything when he came to stand close to her, although on other occasions he addressed her pleasantly enough, even complimenting her on her frying. He had an easy way with him, quite different from his son's. He was more like his two other children, both of whom Kathleen had met when they had returned to the house for an uncle's funeral. He occasionally repeated a joke, he'd been told, and Mrs. Shaughnessy would laugh, her chin becoming lengthy and the skin tightening on her forehead. Wait till I tell you this one, Kitty, he'd sometimes say, alone with her in the dining room. He would tell her something Bob Crow, who ran the barber shop for him, had heard from a customer. 
making the most of the anecdote in a way that suggested he was anxious to entertain her. His manner and his tone of voice denied that it had ever been necessary for him to stand close to her, or else that his practice of doing so had been erased from his memory. But the scarlet complexion of Mr. Shaughnessy's face and the spiky gray hair, the odor of cigarette smoke that emanated from his clothes could not be so easily forgotten by Kathleen. She no longer wept from loneliness in her bedroom, yet she was aware that the behavior of Mr. Shaughnessy lent the feeling of isolation an extra vivid dimension, for in the farmhouse kitchen on Sundays, the behavior could not be mentioned. Every evening, Kathleen sat by the range, thinking about it. The black kitten that had darted out of the oven on her second morning had grown into a cat and sat blinking beside her chair. The alarm clock ticked loudly on the dresser. Was it something she should confess? Was it a sin to be as silent as she was when he came to stand beside her? Was it a sin to be unable to find the courage to tell him to leave her alone? When he stood close, his breathing would become loud and unsteady. He always moved away quite quickly when she wasn't expecting him to. He walked off, never looking back, soundlessly almost. Then one day, when Mrs. Shaughnessy was buying a new skirt and the sun was in the shop, he came into the kitchen where she was scrubbing the draining boards. He came straight to where she sat, as if between them there was some understanding that he should do so. He stood in a slightly different position from usual, behind her rather than at her side, and she felt for the first time his hands passing over her clothes. Mr. Shaughnessy, she whispered. Mr. Shaughnessy, now. He took no notice. Some part of his face was touching her hair. The rhythm of his breathing changed. Mr. Shaughnessy, I don't like it. He seemed not to hear her. She sensed that his eyes were closed. As suddenly and as quickly as always, he went away. Well, Bob, Bob Crow told me a queer one, he said that same evening, while she was placing their plates of fried food in front of them in the dining room. It seems there's a, a woman asleep in Cleary's shop window above in Dublin. His wife expressed disbelief. Bob Crow would tell you anything, she said. In a hypnotic trance, it seems, advertising oh dearest mattresses. Ah, go on now. He's pulling your leg, Des. Not a bit of him. She'll stop there a week, it seems. The guards have to move the crowds on. <laughs> Kathleen closed the dining room door behind her. He had turned to look at her when he'd said there was a woman asleep in Cleary's window, in an effort to include her in what he was retailing. His eyes had betrayed nothing of their surreptitious relationship but Kathleen hadn't been able to meet them. We plowed the field, her father said the following Sunday. I've never turned up earth as good. She almost told him then. She longed to so much she could hardly prevent herself. She longed to let her tears come and hear his voice consoling her. When she was a child, she'd loved that. You're a great girl, he said. Mr. Shaughnessy took to attending an earlier mass than his wife and son, and when they were out at theirs, he would come into the kitchen. When she hid in her bedroom, he followed her there. She'd have locked herself in the outside WC if there'd been a latch on the door. Well, Kitty and myself were quiet enough, he'd say in the dining room later on, when the three of them were eating their midday dinner. She couldn't understand how he could bring himself to speak like that, or how he could so hungrily eat his food as though nothing had occurred. 
She couldn't understand how he could act normally with his son or with his other children when they came on a visit. It was extraordinary to hear Mrs. Shaughnessy humming her songs about the house and calling him by his Christian name. The Kenny girl's getting married, Mrs. Shaughnessy said on one of these mealtime occasions. Tyson from the hardware. I wonder Bob Crow didn't hear that. There's not much Bob misses. Don't go taking ideas from that Kenny girl, Kitty. Mr. Shaughnessy laughed, and Mrs. Shaughnessy laughed, and the son smiled. There wasn't much chance of that, Kathleen thought. Are you going dancing tonight? Mr. Crawley often asked her on a Friday. And she would reply that she might, but she never did because no one displayed any interest in her. In the shops and at mass, no one eyed her in the way Mary Florence had been eyed. And she supposed it was because her looks weren't up to much. But they were good enough for Mr. Shaughnessy with his quivering breath and his face in her hair. Bitterly, she dwelt on that. Bitterly, she imagined herself turning on him in the dining room, accusing him to his wife and son. Did you forget to sweep the yard this week? Mrs. Shaughnessy asked her. Only it's looking poor. She explained that the wind had blown in papers and debris for a knocked over dustbin. She'd sweep it again, she said. I hate a dirty backyard, Kitty. Was this why the other girls had left? The girls whom Mrs. Shaughnessy had trained and who'd then gone off. Those girls, whoever they were, would see her or would know about her. They'd imagine her in one uniform or the other, obedient to him because she enjoyed his attentions. That was how they'd think of her. Leave me alone, sir, she said when she saw him approaching her the next time, but he took no notice. She could see him guessing that she wouldn't scream. Please, sir, she said. Please, sir. I don't like it. But after a time, she ceased to make any protestation and remained as silent as she had been at first. Twelve years, or maybe fourteen, she said to herself, lying awake in her bedroom, as long as that or longer. In her two different uniforms, she would continue to be the outward sign of Mrs. Shaughnessy's well-to-do status. And her ordinary looks would continue to attract the attention of a gray-haired man. Because of the field, the nature of the farm, her father had once been barefoot on would change. Kathleen's field, her father would often repeat. And the mother would say again, that a bargain was a bargain. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts, and access to our archive are made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1990 by 92nd Street Y.